Hey, good morning. Let's play a game. Want to play a game? Okay, here's the game. You can all play at the same time. Um, I ask a question and then I go think, think, too late. And if you don't have the answer out by the time I'm done, you lose. Okay, ready? <laughs> What's your favorite color? Think, think, too late. That was okay. I heard the girl way back there say green, which was incredible. That that came all the way through. Um, okay, um, who's going to win the Super Bowl? Think, think, too late. Yeah. Now that hurt my heart. You live in Illinois, yo. You don't be mentioning the Packers. That was awful. That was, that was, I want to leave. <clears throat> um, so different question, my fault for asking. Um, what kind of car do you drive? Think, think, too late. And do you have any gas in the car? Think, think, too late. And what's the unpaid balance on your visa bill? Think, no, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> All right, ready, 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 ready. Another question. Name the first thing Jesus ever preached on. Think, think, too late. First sermon Jesus ever preached, Luke chapter 4, tells about Jesus coming out of the wilderness after his temptation. He went up to Nazareth, and as it was uh, his custom, it says, and you can turn there if you want to, if it's not where I'm preaching from, Luke chapter 4, verse 16, uh, he's, he uh, goes up to the temple on the Sabbath, and he stood up to read uh, from the scriptures, and do you know what scroll was given to him? Think, think. Isaiah was given to him. So now he's got the scroll of Isaiah in his hand. He's about to start. Jesus Christ is about to start his ministry, and he gets Isaiah put in his hand, and he's supposed to read something. Now, think about it. He can read whatever he wants. Oh, they're passing out Bibles now, and uh, if you don't have a Bible, you can just keep that one. It's not a thing. Guest preachers are so generous, you know, and <laughs> just, just take that. And there's a pile at the back if you've got friends. <clears throat> So Jesus gets up, he's got the scroll of Isaiah in his hand, and where's he going to read from? How about Isaiah 53, you know? And, and he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. How many people, that'd be a good one, right? Or, or how, about, how about Isaiah 40? Um, you know, those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength, they will mount up with wings like eagles. Or, or how about Isaiah 6? You know, I, I saw... Uh, the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. That would be awesome. Or how about Isaiah 55? You can read from Isaiah 55. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the water, and you who have no money, come and buy. And I mean, that would be amazing. Uh, all, no, 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 no. He turns to Isaiah 61. First sermon Jesus ever preached, first passage ever in the beginning of his ministry. He chooses Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is, this is his first words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to proclaim liberty to the captives. So, right at the focal point of Jesus' ministry is this word freedom. Freedom, 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 freedom. Died for our sins so we could be forgiven and rose from the dead for our freedom. But sadly, sadly, freedom is the last word that you would use to describe a lot of Christ followers. Uptight, tense, angry, frustrated, not free, not free. He's going for freedom, but we're not getting to freedom. In John chapter 8, he said, He whom the Son sets free will be free indeed. So, all in favor of freedom? We've got to have more freedom, less bondage. And I want to talk about a especially persnickety little bondage in this message. If you I would open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 4. I would like to uh, talk about um, uh, something that I have battled and experienced increasing freedom. I just want to testify to increasing freedom. I cannot testify to a lack of struggle on this point. It would not be honest. But I can testify, praise God, to increasing freedom in this area. 
and I long for you to know it too. Uh, the subject of this message is freedom from a people pleasing. Freedom from people pleasing. <clears throat> now, um, I have a definition uh, here, uh, and I just have to confess at this moment that I, I hope <laughs> I'm going to give you my definition for people pleasing, and I, I really, really hope that you like it. Now here it is, I worked on this for a long time, all right? A people pleasing is a definition, people pleasing. Living so that people will be pleased with me. Thank you. <laughs> Hold your applause. Live, this is a bondage here. Living so that people will be pleased with me. That, that's sin. Living so that people will like me. Living so that people, certain people, will accept me. That people will think I'm a neat guy. Well, people think I'm a nice guy. Living to be popular. Living to receive affirmation. Living for pats on the back. Living to gain applause, living to acquire recognition from my mom and my dad, from my children, from my boss, from my neighbor, from my college roommate, from my friends, living so that people will be pleased with me. Easy to define, <clears throat> terrifically difficult to get freedom from. It is a bondage to be sure. Now, this is, this is not to say um, that, um, like, the, in some things, um, the opposite uh, is uh, the cure. So, um, in a stealing, taking things that aren't mine, um, we're going for the opposite on that. We're going for generosity. Not, not taking what isn't mine. We're going for giving what is mine. Is that right? Am I right about that? Oh, I heard you clapping for the offering. At least a couple of people here at the front clapped. I kind of like that. Can I try that again? We're going to take the offering. <clears throat> a couple of people were like, not two times. <laughs> this is happy one time. So, so... Um, in some things, we're going for the opposite. Um, but with people pleasing, people pleasing, I'm going to, what's the opposite? Living so that people will hate me. Now, some of you, by the way, got that going pretty good. And <laughs> so um, we don't live so people will be pleased with us, but we do want to be kind and tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you, Ephesians 4. So we're not going for the opposite here. We're just trying to get free from living so that people will be pleased with me. And it's a big problem. It's a bondage. It's a big, big-time pain uh, in our lives. Now, the main reason why people-pleasing causes so much pain is because it promises something that it never delivers. People pleasing is promising you acceptance and security, and it will never, ever give you that. Because, and I'll say more about this later, uh, people who require you to please them, it's not about you already it's about them and so it will never be enough like are you ever going to get to the bible yes thank you for asking that and if you hadn't said so i would have forgotten <clears throat> a little fun in peoria today are you okay <laughs> come on first corinthians 4 paul says this is how one should regard us as servants of christ as stewards of the mystery of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. Some of your Bibles say faithful. That's a well-known verse, but this next one, not so much. 
after he says that we got to be faithful, he can almost hear the people that he could be in bondage to saying, yeah, well, you're not faithful. So he goes right after that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he says, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge or I do not even, I'm not even aware of uh, anything. Uh, in, in fact, pardon me, I do not even judge myself. Um, I, I just feel like you're going to be so unhappy with how I read that verse. Can I just read it again? <laughs> but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in the darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from, say it, from God. Okay, that's real straightforward. Now we're just going to go through that and we're going to pull out, uh, with God's help, uh, three uh, things to get us free from people pleasing and um, check your Bible each time. Make sure it's there. So I'm going to show, I want to show it to you. I just want to tell you, I want to show it to you in the Bible. Here's the first one. Freedom from people pleasing. I got to minimize, minimize my focus on what people think uh, of me. Now, I have no joy in saying this, but uh, the fact is, is that uh, born again Christians, someone Someone lift up their voice and say, I'm one. Okay, so I'm going to give you another run at that. Fact is, born-again Christians can be some of the harshest, most judgmental people on the face of the earth. Right? And why? Why? Because we have absolute truth in our hands. Hold up your Bible if you've got a Bible here. Come on, hold it up high. All right? So look at all you Bible thumpers down here in Peoria. You got a Bible, and most of your neighbors are watching these controversial, you know, abortion on demand, same sex marriage, whatever is the latest um, deterioration in the morality of society. Most people are like, eh, eh things are changing. Eh. They don't have a big opinion about it because they don't have a reference manual on what God says. Now, there's no problem, no problem of any kind having a conviction about what God's Word says, um, but I will just say as a truth person, uh, learning under immense uh, pressure from the Lord to be a grace and truth person, which I praise God for that, I'll just say that um, all truth and no love is brutality, and it's also true that all a love and no truth is hypocrisy. It's actually a fairly short list of things that we have to agree about. And, and um, if I tell the people in our church all the time, so I'll tell you, if you have a gay friend, or for certainly, certainly there are people in this room right now uh, battling and wrestling with the issue of same-sex attraction. Um, if you're not the most loving person that that person knows, that's a fail. That's a fail. All right. We are not in charge of legislating morality. We are in charge of proclaiming a Savior who sets people free. We're not even free from people-pleasing yet. Okay? So, um, uh, God forgive us for our... And, and why do they call us Bible thumpers? Why? Because we're always the guy that shows up in any discussion and starts pounding people with the Bible. And, and uh, if you've listened to me uh, preach at all, if you have, I don't assume you have, but if you have, I'm, I'm certainly not apologizing for the Bible. Is that fair? All right. but, but tone, tone, tone. Check your tone. All right? And, and uh, don't want to be one of those people. Don't want to be one of those angry, old, bitter people who, who aren't tenderized by the love of God and the Spirit of God. I think Paul was facing some of this. It's very clear that the carnal Corinthians were critical. Those things go together a lot. The carnal Corinthians were critical and Paul was wrestling with it and so he put them on notice and said, with me, it is a very small thing that I should be... See, he's minimizing 
his focus on their people pleasing. He's just telling them straight out. To me, it's, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you. Wow. Now, <laughs> to be careful here, notice that he doesn't say it's nothing. All right? So a Christian would never say, what you think of me is nothing. It's nothing. Quick, let me run and get what you think of me matters to me. Here it is. <laughs> I found it. Quick, get a thimble and fill it full of how much I care about what you think. It's, it's not saying that. It's not saying it's nothing. You've got to get through the whole message. He is saying it's a, it's a thing. Turn to your neighbor and say it's a thing. It's a thing. It's just a small thing. To me it is a very small, oh, 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 oh yeah, it's, a very, it's not small. I was wrong. I was wrong. I've been corrected by the word of God. It's not small. What is it? It's very small. I wrote down, it's itsy, bitsy, teeny, weeny, small. Now, I'm not suggesting that you tell somebody that, by the way. This is the scriptures. I'm not saying you go home and say to your wife, hey, honey, just by the way, I know you got some thoughts about me sitting here watching the second football game. I know I haven't moved in six hours. This is a small thing to me. Okay. Uh, okay, man, do or do not do that. Do, come on, vote with me, man. Do or do not. I'm going to go with a do not on that, okay? Um, but as it relates to people-pleasing, um, notice he says, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you. I'm just going through the words here. Do you see the next part? Or any human court. Any human court. Now, he's possibly referring to government, but more than likely he's referring to some self-appointed, self-convened. It's interesting, the harshest critics were never convened under any authority. They're self-appointed, self-convened uh, critics. And he says, yeah, that human court, yeah, that's, that doesn't have God's authority, that doesn't have governmental authority, nobody elected them to be in charge of that. Can I tell you what I think? Um, or not. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, but it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. Um, jot these down. We're in the heart of the message now. Um, jot these down. Five reasons for minimizing your focus on what people think. Five reasons for minimizing your focus on people-pleasing. Uh, number one, uh, people all want different, are you listening? People all want different things. And be uh, a good listener and be spirited, uh, be fun, be respectable, be relaxed with me. Um, they all want different things. I need your time, I need your money, I need your attention, I need strokes, I need opportunity. Can you help me? Will you help me? Do for me. People, true or false, people all want just, th just think of the complicated nature of that. People all want different things. And because people all want different things, you, you can become like a, like a professional juggler. And because I've worked so hard at becoming a professional juggler, I'd like to just kind of give you a sample of how a people pleaser feels when they're constantly having to juggle things. Now, if I was a better planner, I would have, two, I would have three tennis balls or... or three apples or something, but because I'm a bad planner, I have uh, three muffins. Now, by the way, I'm not tattling on any pastors or elders, but I'm just going to say they're eating a lot of muffins backstage here, if you don't know that, okay? And it was hard to wrestle three away from them, but I got it done. And, and uh, so this, if you know how to juggle, how many people know how to juggle? Okay, do you know how to juggle? Yeah, so this is, this is um, I'm just going to, I'm a bit nervous, but I'm pretty awesome at this, okay? Um, so, this is, you know, I want my mom to be happy with who I married. And uh, this is, I want my friends to be impressed with my career. And this is, I want my kids to think I'm amazing. That's a lot. My mom, my friends, my kids. This is going to blow your mind. Okay, ready? Someone say, ready, go. Yeah, that was going better in my mind. I, did, did you want to clap for me? Did you? 
It's not hard to kind of smile about some muffins at the front of the church. But the fact is, is that a lot of people actually feel like professional jugglers. And I, and I got my, they're calling me on the phone and I got to go, and they're just, and, and it's like, you know, and eventually, inevitably, been there, done that, got my eyes off the Lord, got trying to keep these people happy, and it didn't work. People all want different things. Here's the second part of it. People all want different things. People, here, this is harder. People often want wrong things. Proverbs uh, 29, 25 says that the fear of man brings a snare. And this is the lesson of adolescence. When you think now, some of you, back to 10, 20, 30 years ago in high school, and you think about those people and how much their opinion meant to you, and how much does it mean now? It's laughable, but it was so much. And what they wanted wasn't even good for you. They were, you know, as foolish as we were. They didn't know any. And then you try to tell your kids, you're not going to care in a couple of years what these people think. But you, they can't hear it. It gets consuming. You hearing this? You're not going to care. You aren't. You won't remember most of them. It's such a snare. So five reasons for minimizing my focus on what people think of me. Uh, people uh, all want different things. People often want wrong things that aren't even good for me. Um, and then this, uh, people pleasing. I mentioned it already. People pleasing is impossible. It actually can't be done because people who base relationship on performance, not acceptance, are never satisfied. Now, this is a bit uncomfortable, but some of you here are in a marriage, and that person may even be at church today, even with you today, and it doesn't matter how good the meal is, it doesn't matter how big the paycheck is, it doesn't matter how many things you did on Saturday morning, it doesn't matter how hard you tried to take care of him, it's never going to be enough. That's a bondage. It is a bondage. If you think all of a sudden some, and we should serve our spouses and we should serve our families, but we should serve them as unto the Lord and not in expectation of some recognition, some pat on the back, some breakthrough that may or may not be coming. Trying to please people is like crutching clutching at straws, grasping the wind. Acceptance always eludes. Here's the fourth reason. Five reasons for minimizing my focus on pleasing others. People pleasing is destructive. I mean, to spend your life pursuing a goal that can't be reached, I mean, how devastating is that? How potentially crushing uh, is that? It's very painful. So many meetings with so many people, emotionally drained and devastated, trying to please them, to gain their approval. People in ministry fall into this, whether your ministry is vocational or non-vocational. This is a huge thing for people who get drawn into ministry because they love people. And then I'll tell you what, um, the number of people, I got 30 years logged in this pastoral ministry thing now, and let me just tell you something, some of the best people are only going to be the best people until you have to tell them something they don't want to hear and it can all go in the ditch i mean fast it's hard to believe really you're going to cash all of this for this yes i am and and so just to set your expectations from the very beginning people pleasing can, is very very destructive and then this people pleasing disqual this is the biggest thing people pleasing disqualifies me as a servant of christ Galatians 1.10 says, do I seek the favor of men? Paul said, for if I seek the favor of men, I cannot be the servant of Christ. I think of the hard things I've had to go through and the things I've had to endure and the things that I've had to press on through and learn what God had for me and, and uh, look away from pleasing people and look to 
pleasing the Lord. So we're gonna, uh, this is all under minimize it. Got three things for you here. This is the first one. Uh, to get free from people pleasing, I'm going to minimize my focus on what people think of me. It's a very small thing. That's it. You know, <clears throat> can I just tell you what your mother-in-law thinks of you? <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. But before you do, just give me a second to say to myself, this is a very small thing. I think that's a really good thing to say. It's a, it's a very small thing. Say it. Now, do not turn to your neighbor and say it, but with eyes focused on the front, lift up your voice and say it again. Say, it's a very small thing. It's a very small thing. Paul says, to me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. So, let's get some application here. Uh, driving home from Christmas, which has just passed, and the dinner and the thoughts you had and the connections you wanted to make, and now you're on your way home and there was a painful conversation and it didn't go the way you wanted it to. And you got a uh, face full of why we call those extended family. Just say it to yourself. Just say it. It's a very small thing. And after a long day with a difficult, demanding, never satisfied boss, before you bring that anger and frustration into your house, when you pull into the driveway, just gather it all up and say to yourself, it's a very small thing. And after a painful conversation with a demanding friend who used you and took everything good you had to give and then turned on you, just say to yourself, it's a very small thing. In fact, I've been working on a uh, a People Pleasers Anonymous uh, theme song. Because, because, hang on, hang on, hang on. Because, um, uh, you know, you know when you go to, like, if you've ever been to one of the addiction recovery things, like, you know, like Alcoholics Anonymous, or you've seen it talked about on television, you say, um, so, you know how to respond? You know how to respond? Because let's just say we're at one of these, this is People Pleasers Anonymous, and, uh, hi, my name's James. I'm a recovering people pleaser. And um, so anyway, how many people have been to Disney World? Been to Disney World? Okay, there is one. You know there is one. Eh? There is one um, absolutely satanic ride at Disney World. Do you, know, do you know that? Do you know that? Did you go to it? Yeah, you get in that little thing with those little wooden things, and, you, and it's... I remember when I was a kid, that, thing so, that ride is so boring. It's so boring. And, 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 and it goes on forever. When I was a kid, I would, you know when you're falling asleep and waking up, it seems like it's going on for a year? And I would fall asleep, and then I'd wake up probably 30 seconds later, but it seemed like 30 minutes later, and we'd come around the corner, there's more of these dolls. And I, so to me, to this day, I've taken my grandkids there. It's like, that's like, to me, it's like the house of horrors. <laughs> so because I hate that place and hate people-pleasing, um, here's the theme song. Because small thing. Come on, it's a say, but but not world thing. So you could be like this week driving in your car and just got just beat up by something. Some sales call just went awful, and doesn't matter how much you've served that client, it just is not enough. And just I can just see you riding in your car, and you're like it's. A small thing after all. Got it? Yeah. All right, so that's our theme song now. So um, here's the second thing. I'm going to minimize my focus on what people think of me. Then this. This is maybe harder. I'm going to minimize my focus on what I think of myself. Sometimes other people are not the enemy. Sometimes the hardest person to please in your life is you. See, with me, it's a very small thing. Verse 3, that I should be judged by you or any by human court. Notice the end of the verse. I do not even judge myself. I'm not aware of anything against myself. Verse 4. I'm, but I'm not, I'm not acquitted. He's just like, I'm, I'm just not saying. I'm not saying that I don't have any major issues. I'm not aware of any, but I'm just not saying. Why, Paul? Well, because... My primary responsibility as a follower of Jesus is not to be constantly 
um, even myopically um, scouring myself. Now, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight 28 uh, does say, uh, Paul judged himself. He, he examined his life. Man, let a man examine himself, he said. But he didn't go over every single thing he ever did. Just some of you do this. Some of you, are, I can see it in your faces, like, what are you talking about, man? I, didn't, I'm, I don't do this to myself. But others of you are like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe he's talking about this. Right, because you have this soundtrack playing in your head all the time. I suck, I suck, I suck. I'm awful, I'm awful, I'm awful. I failed, I, I don't measure up. And you have this going all the time. You've got this like bar set so high, you'll never clear it. And you don't need anybody else to tell you that you are a failure because they'd have to stop you from talking to even get a word in. That's what I'm talking about right there. And I just think it's so interesting that Paul says, to me it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. And then he goes right to, I don't judge myself either. I'm not judging myself. I'm not constantly going over myself, evaluating myself, giving myself a report card. How was that dinner? How clean is the house? How does everything look? Am I getting it done? In fact, Christians are the worst for this. Can I just say Christians are the worst? I love Christians. I'm one, as far as I know. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, but I, how many people say, I believe I'm a follower of Jesus. Put up your hand if you say you were. If you're not, get on the train now because it's awesome and it's free and it's forever. What are you waiting for? So come on with us on this, but um, if you're a follower of Jesus, I just want to say that um, uh, for me, um, the, the, the battle to be free from people-pleasing is sometimes revealed in this crazy Christian stuff like um, I'm, I go to three services every single weekend. I don't I only go into one live because I wear my voice out if I go in and sing in them all, but I uh, go to one service for worship and three or four services to preach. I talk to a lot of Christians. So here's a, here's a Christian play. Um, hey, uh, Sheila, that was a really great song you sang this morning. What does she say? Well, sadly, a lot of times she, she, Christians come out with stuff like, Oh, oh, it wasn't me. It was the Holy Spirit. Really? Really? Because the Holy Spirit was doing a lot better job through Jeff last week. <laughs> really? Really? We can't even encourage you? You can't just say thank you? Well, no, I can't say thank you because I can't let anyone tell me that what I did was good because I can't hear that because I can't ever, ever be satisfied. And I am so hard on myself and I go over myself and over myself. Again, let me just say for some of you, this is like, whew. but for others of you, this is, we are on it. So I have to minimize my focus on what people think of me. I have to minimize my focus on what I think about myself. I wish we understood humility better. The, lately, there's been a bit of a thing writing books on the subject of humility. There's quite a number of them that have come out. I don't have a critique of any of them. And it wouldn't matter anyway what I thought of them. But I'll just say this. Humility is not, not a deportment thing. So I was watching you before and you were up on the stage, right? And I, I thought you came across super humble, but I thought the guy, that, where's, the, where's the guy who's playing the piano? See here? I thought he, I didn't think he came across, see, really, 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 you can watch a person? No, the answer is you cannot. You cannot watch a person and know whether they are humble or not. Turn to your neighbor and say, you cannot. Look at you, you cannot tell those kind of things. Look at, nowhere in the Bible are we ever told anywhere uh, to be humble. We're told to humble ourselves. Humility is not a be thing, humility is a do thing. Do you get it? Okay, humility is like uh, exercise. If I said to you, this is funny you brought that up, you look like you could use some. I, <laughs> if I said to you this morning, well, I would just, you can't believe I had the most awesome exercise thoughts this week. Like, I'm telling you, there was a couple of days there where I just pictured myself running and sweating. <laughs> And I'm telling you, man, I got that feeling of being exercised, and I felt so exercised. <laughs> that's dumb. All God's people said, say it. Say that's dumb. Say it. <laughs> that's dumb. It, obviously, exercise is a do thing, yo. It's not a think thing. Correct. Like humility. 
Humility is not a thing. This is not in the Bible. Humility is a do thing. It's something you actually have to exercise yourself in doing. And having said that, because what does the world say at this point? You know, if you're the person who's so hard on yourself and you're always putting yourself down and you have this high standard nobody can meet, the world says, hey, you got to pump it up, baby. You got to get up and you got to look in the mirror and you got to be like, I am still awesome. Seriously. Like, I, and you got, you got to, you got to, but isn't that crazy though? See, the answer to low self esteem is not high self-esteem. The person with low self-esteem has the same problem as the person with high self-esteem. They're thinking about themselves, okay? And the answer to low self-esteem is not to go around saying you're awesome or listen to some crazy, nothing worse than those preachers on television, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Always pumping it up, giving you all this false bravado. With some, some, look at, the biblical message is not low or high self-esteem. The humble person is not the person who's making, you know, I hate myself, I'm so awful. And the answer is not high self-esteem. The answer is no esteem of self. I'm not even thinking about myself. Jesus said, he who loses his life for my sake will find it. I'm not thinking about myself at all. It's not about me. There's the freedom right there. Freedom from my focus on myself is not to try to get it perfect or get to the place where I don't care. The place is to do it for others, for the Lord, with no thought of self at all. I love this verse. It's so simple that I just can't explain it away. Proverbs 3, 7 says, Do not be wise in your own eyes. How clear is that, right? So I've studied this really carefully, right? And I just want to explain it to you now. You ready for me to explain it to you? Do not be wise in your own eyes. Are you ready? I'm going to break this down for you. Do not (laughs) be. Now that could have been the second coming of Christ right there. (laughs) How many people want to go now? I mean, I was like, awesome. I don't know what that was, but I hope it happens again. (laughs) Maybe he's just swinging by us, going up to Chicago, and he's coming back for us. There's only a few people up there anyways. He says, he won't be long. I digress. Are you with me? Do not be wise in your own eyes. It's so perfect, right? How could you possibly wiggle out of that? Don't have a high opinion of anything about yourself. Nor get into the false humility of putting yourself down. But simply lose yourself completely in serving Christ and faithfulness to Him. All right, we're almost done. Right out of the text. I'm going to minimize my focus on what people think of me. I'm going to minimize my focus on what I think of myself. Now, the rest of this whole message is just how to do it. From the end of verse 4 and verse 5, then we're going to be on our way. So here's the main. Maximize my focus on what God thinks of me. That's it. See it there? How how do you do this, Paul? Well, I I stopped thinking about myself completely. End of verse 4. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will will receive his commendation from God. Three times in the text, it's pretty straightforward. Maximize my focus on what God thinks of me. Now, how many people, just interpretation by voting, because i got to hurry a bit here. How many people would agree that it's easier to be concerned about what a person right in front of you thinks than to be concerned about what God thinks. How many people would say, it's easier to be concerned about a person who's demanding something right now than God who's like so patient and she'll figure it out soon, and, right? So, so how, how, everyone say how. How are we going to maximize our focus on what God thinks? Four things, super fast, here they are. One, um, why would we do this? Maximize our focus on what God thinks. Uh, number one, because people judge at the wrong time. 
Have you noticed that? People judge at the wrong time. That's why he says, it is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time. Did you know there's a time coming? How many people knew there's a time coming? Now, as the followers of Jesus, we're not going to get judged eternally. We're forgiven eternally for our sins, but we are going to go through an assessment. All right, we're going to have 1 Corinthians 3, talks about the judgment seat of Christ, that each one must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that he may give an account of himself, what he's done in his body, whether good or bad, and the fire will test every man's work of what sort it is. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, then each one's praise will come from God alone. Now, that day's on the calendar already, bro. I don't know how many pages ahead, but trust me when I tell you, when you flip the page, it's circled. Okay? And you're going to stand before Jesus Christ, and you are going to answer for your life. You say, I don't, I don't think I'm going to go. You'll be there. Well, you know, I'm not really much of an upfront person. I don't, I don't really like to... Okay, hey, trust me when I tell you, you're going. I don't know how long your speech is going to be, but you are personally going to answer. You will look into his eyes. You will see his nail-pierced hands. And, and the, the, the eyes of him to whom we must give an account will gaze upon you. And you will answer. Now, take what your sister thinks of you and put it in that box. And then all of a sudden, okay, now I got it right. So you're going to maximize my focus on what he thinks of me. Because let me just tell you, can I give you a little advance notice? I've been studying this super careful. When you're, just, I'll just give this to you right now. And then later when we're standing in line, I hope I get like really close to you. Because I'm just going to be like, I told you this was coming. <laughs> and then I'll be like, you go first. <laughs> right? And here's a little tip. After Jesus says, what was up with you? I mean, that's going to be a really bad time to say, well, you know, the thing was my mom. I'm just going to tell you, I wouldn't be bringing anybody else up if I was you, for what it's worth. Now, I know I was pretty awful, but, 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 but my sister, my dad, my boy, I would not, I would not bring anyone else up if I were you, for what it's worth. It's going to go super bad right then. Ditch, ditch. <laughs> Each one must give an account of, next word, himself. Himself to God. So, um, so that helps a lot. Thank you, Holy Spirit, through Paul. Judge nothing before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden. People judge at the wrong time. Jot this down. God has all the facts. People are always trying to rush in ahead of time. Let me tell you what I think about that. Well, actually, we're kind of waiting for the verdict. It's not over yet. Jesus is going to tell us what he thinks of it. You can tell me if you want to, but it's, you know, it's mental notes. not going to be a big thing what they say. God has all the facts. He will both, see it there at the end of verse 4? It says, he will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness. Look up here. Do you believe that there are some things that are hidden? Do you believe that there's some things why she is the way that she is that you don't even know? Do you think that he may have, some things may have happened to him and, and you don't know the whole story? And God forgive us for our judgments and our conclusions about one another when we're told judge nothing before the time. People judge at the wrong time. God has all the facts. This is really important. God knows all the motives. God will disclose the purposes, see it there? The purposes of the heart. That's why people do what they do. The worst thing that Christians do, stop doing this. The worst things that Christians do is they judge motives. I was playing golf this week, Kathy, and I just came back from a vacation as part of how I was able to be so blessed to be here with you. And I was golfing with this guy, and out of the blue, he says to me, he says, you know, I, at my church, I just feel like the leaders of my church, I just really struggle with where they're coming from and why they're doing it. I said, well, hang on. He said, he said, what should I do about that? I said, well, the first thing you can do is get off God's property. He's like, what? What? I said, dude, get off God's property. What are you, what are you talking about? Here's what I'm talking about. Over and over and over, the Bible tells us don't judge people's motives. 
Don't ever say, I know why he X. Don't ever say that, ever. Why, why should you never say that? Because you don't know, arrogant person trying to be God. How many people would agree that it's fairly arrogant to try to be God? If, if while we were singing this morning, the great I am, the great I am, if you would have stood up and gone. <laughs> How many people would have a problem with that? I think you get put under church discipline like right away. <laughs> There's only one God. And he's the only one that sees people's hearts. Don't ever say why someone, you don't know why. You can, now you have to judge what people do. Jesus said, don't cut your pearls before swine. You can judge actions. Well, you can get off God's property. You can't judge motives. And you shouldn't let people judge yours. Only God knows the motives. He will disclose the purposes of the heart. Last thing, then each one's praise, each one will receive his commendation from God. Maximize my focus on what God thinks of me. People judge at the wrong time. Only God has the facts. Only God knows the motives. Because ultimately, only God's assessment of me matters. Just think about that. 100 years from today, what's, gonna ma what's it going to matter what your teacher said about you? 100 years from today, what's going to matter what that difficult relationship, whatever it is, what's going to matter? You know, maximize your focus on what God thinks, all right? Minimize your focus on pleasing others. Minimize your focus on what you think of yourself. And maximize your focus on what God thinks of you. To me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. For he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time. For the time is coming when the Lord will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, the secret motivations of the heart. Then each one's praise will come from God alone. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. There is such clarity in it. And by your spirit, you have convicted us and nourished within us afresh the expectation that this is something we can be free from. Would you be with the spouse who is weary in doing good because the motive has been to gain an affirmation that has not come? And would you be with the parent who has spent, exhausted themselves for the appreciation of that child and it hasn't come and it may not come but you see lord you are not so unjust as to forget our labor of love in having ministered to the saints as we now do and so we thank you god that our faults are covered by the blood of jesus and are committed faithful by your grace service to you is seen and noted and the day is coming quickly when we will answer to you for all of this so make us increasingly faithful give us eyes to see ourselves help us to live in the grace of your immense favor and acceptance of us but let us not use that as an excuse to sin but let us press on and offer our lives afresh as a sacrifice to you make us free we pray from pleasing others and make the passion of our lives we make it our aim Paul said, we make it our aim to please you. In Jesus' name, amen.